Welcome to this episode of the Comedy Defect Podcast. My name is Winter, I'm a comedian, and this is my show. Those that are new to the show, welcome. Those that are old to the show, welcome back, guys. This episode is episode 79 with a totally unique and original alternative comic, Al Lubel. He's been going about 30 years. He has been on The Tonight Show. He's been on uh, Letterman. And he's been smashing awards around here. Got he got the uh, Moose Moose Award, uh, and like, we talk about that in the in the podcast. It's not often I get nervous before podcasts, but this one I didn't realize it was until I listened to the edit back. It took me a while to settle. Sometimes it takes a long time for the guests to settle, but for me, it was on my shoulders that time. Uh, I hope you enjoy. It. I left most of the mistakes in so you can laugh at and tell your friends about. But I'm just going to show you. Look, it's not always perfect. You just got to roll with it sometimes. So you can find Al, he's on the internet on www.allubel.com. He's on Twitter as Al Lubel and all those places as Al Lubel. Um, yeah, so that is him. So if you ever see him on a bill, go and check him out. You will not see the like of him again. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and I'm on Facebook as at Winter Dominus. I'm on Twitter at Joker Season. And you can find this podcast on Facebook the Comedy Defect. We have a Facebook page and we also have a group if you want to join that and you'll see all the podcasts pop up there too. If you want to support the podcast, you can. Go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defect Podcast and donate as much or as little as you want. I know it's difficult these days. Everyone's locked in. Jobs are difficult. Everyone's asking you to donate to everything. But if you can, just share your favourite episode, tell your friends about it or leave us a nice review. Or you know what, right? Just enjoy it and just write me a little message and say, I really like that one. Keep it up. That's it. It really helps me out. Anyway, so I bladdered on enough. This is episode 79 with a very funny, totally unique comic, Mr. Al Lubel. Al Lubel, thanks for coming on the podcast, uh, man. Thanks for having me. I want to have you on because um, Adam Bloom he gave you a massive endorsement. He said, the most original comedian I've ever seen. Wow. And so, um, and no pressure tonight. I mean, right. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Because I've chatted to you briefly at other gigs, again, about maybe six years ago. We did that one uh, at Old Street, which was like, I don't think it's... Is that the new material night? Yeah, that's right, there. You've been on, like, I know everyone says this, you've been on The Tonight Show six times, right? Yeah, let me think. Seven times, I think. Seven times, right. Okay, and you were on Letterman five times, is that right? Is that still five? (laughs) Yeah, right, yeah. 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 And so, like... uh, It's off, it's not happening anymore. It's impossible for me. That's my thought, that's what I was saying. (laughs) So, like, um, you're, you're from Florida. No, I'm from New York City. I'm from New York City, right? Yeah, right, right, yeah. And because but I went to college in Florida. Oh, right. Well, I went freshman year in Maryland, University of Maryland, mm-hmm. and then the rest, undergrad and law school, I went to Miami, Florida. And the law school thing, you're, you're like one of like maybe four great comics that I know who used to be lawyers. You've got um, you've got Yanni Agisolo, um you've got Mark... I, I yeah. didn't realize, Yanni, is, is that the... Is the Yanni, oh, wait, I always get confused. Is Yanni the guy from Australia, New Zealand? That's right. Australia. Yeah. He's, I didn't know he was a lawyer. Yeah, he used to be a lawyer, yeah, yeah. And uh, oh. he, he uh, just went to comedy. He's like, right, I'll just, this is my thing. Wow. And uh, you got Mark Palmer as well. Mark Palmer, I've heard of him. Yeah, South I think African it, guy. Yes, I did a gig with him recently, so yeah. a few months ago. I didn't know he was a lawyer either. Yeah, he used to be a lawyer as well. Okay, who's another one? Um, yourself. I think there's three or four. Um, okay, there's a few more. I read your bio. And really? you were saying about like how your mom forced you to become a lawyer. Well, she didn't force me, but they kind of brainwashed me. I think the way she raised me, I didn't wasn't really trained to think for myself. I'm guessing uh, because I didn't really give it much thought. I just figured I'll go to college and be a lawyer, a doctor, a lawyer, uh, and I didn't think about. It. I never thought I could be a doctor. It seemed too mm. complicated and too. I don't know. It just seemed too hard. Lawyer seemed a little easier. Did you do it by years? So like, okay, well, a doctor is like ten years plus, and then a lawyer is like seven, how many years? Yeah, seven for law. Seven, right. For law, yeah, any doctor. But I didn't think like that. I don't know why it never occurred to me, doctor, because, uh, you know, just, I guess watching TV shows, you know, they had the lawyer, you know, shows, you know, but they also had doctor shows. I don't know why. You know, I think I saw a psychiatrist as a kid, you know, and I think I felt more like a patient than a doctor. (laughs) (laughs) So it didn't even occur to me to be a doctor. Yeah, it's like they're asking asking you how they feel. You're like, no, but how how, do you think I'm okay? (laughs) Right, 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 exactly. You're both lying down on the couch. (laughs) But because I saw your, uh, I saw like, you know, I researched you and I saw you like, you were on Dr. Katz as well in the 80s as well, all that stuff. The 90s. Sorry, the 90s. You were, and that's in New York, so you got into that through in New York, is that her? Dr. Katz thing, I taped it in LA actually. No, no, I did tape it in New York. 
a very funny comedian who's doing real well now, Todd Barry. Yeah. New York comedian. Mm. Yeah, he helped, he got me on there because I didn't have the connections or I didn't have, I never was on there. And I was on there late in, you know, I think I got on there in like 96 or 97. Uh, but I think it had been, well, no, maybe late 90s because I think it started in 95 maybe or something. Mm. But anyway, Todd got my tape to uh, Dr. Katz, uh, Jonathan Katz, very funny comic. So yeah, that's when I did it. Mm. So you studied in uh, University of Maryland, say? Uh, Maryland, my freshman year, right. and then Miami, the rest, the rest, the last six years, undergrad and law school. Mm-hmm. And uh, what, why did you why did you move to Miami? Because that's your hometown, is that right? Too? Well, no, I grew up in Queens, New York, okay, New York. and then um, my I was an only child. Me, my mother, and father moved to Maryland my freshman year because my father was ill, and they didn't want to tell me, they didn't want to scare me. Mm-hmm. So, but my mother's sister lived in Maryland, so they figured be close to the family. If something happens, and he did sadly die a year later, but uh, so I went to Maryland my freshman year because we moved to Maryland, and I wanted to get away from my parents and everybody, so I knew my I knew about Miami and I'd been there for spring break before, so I didn't wasn't too scared to go. So I went away to college the rest of the time in Miami, and I left Maryland. You were gigging in between time. No, I didn't done stand up yet. So you finished your degree in in, in law in, in law school. Yeah, I won this. Uh, I was experiment. I was take acting classes undergrad. I was a psychology major undergrad. Oh. So I took an acting class. I was in the sc- little parts in the school play. Do you remember what you were? Yeah, I, I know they invented one character that wasn't in the play. I think oh. they invented it for me. Or oh no, that was in the char- It was in the play. It was Damn Yankees. You ever hear that? No, it's a play yeah it's a well-known play like from the 50s or something and uh so they let me play a little character in there and yeah, damn yankees and uh i remember ray liotta was part you know he's like a, an actor a well-known actor he was in goodfellas mm. he played like the lead in goodfellas right okay so he was in my school oh, wow. and uh but you know i wasn't a serious actor but uh but then i would try uh they had like a stand-up contest in in the in the college and i won it and i got a trip to la to perform at a club but I didn't I wasn't able to do it because I heard my back playing basketball when I got to LA hmm. so I couldn't get on stage right. there but uh so that was I then in law school they had us every Sunday night they had a room in Fort Lauderdale is an hour north of Miami hmm. for mostly singers but stand-up comics could try and that's when I started trying to like things out on every Sunday I hmm. drive up to Lauderdale so I was constantly bombing you know just, oh, yeah. it was very, I had no mm-hmm. idea what I was doing mm-hmm. But there was a veteran comic that uh, would come in, and he was good friends with uh, Jackie Gleason, and I feel like right, yes, yeah, yeah. Somehow he knew. I think he dated Jackie Gleason's daughter or something, and so we would go to coffee shops, and I'd talk to him and ask him about it. He was a, he would always do great, and uh, so I, in law school, I was going up, you know, about once a week at the most uh, mm-hmm. while I was in law school, and I always I already knew I really wanted to do comedy. I really never really wanted to be a lawyer, but I was not. It was a way for me to stay out of adulthood, you know, another three years of college. It yeah. was, I didn't want, never wanted to grow up. I was just afraid of it, afraid of growing up. I didn't feel like confident. I don't think I passed through childhood successfully as like I didn't hit the right stages. I, I was so given into by my mother right. that I didn't develop enough of a sense of self. So I had no confidence. Like I had like in some ways too much confidence in some ways wildly not enough sort of like you overcompensated for the the lack of by by doing things that would make it what a confident person would do if you know what i mean yeah that's that right? part of it yeah to overcompensate yeah i felt like uh, for example i won president of student government in my senior year in college mm-hmm. and i think part of the reason i ran was to overcompensate like you know if i win this i'll be more special on the other hand but my mother would always say to me, you're the best, you're the greatest, right? Mm-hmm. So I verbally, I heard it in my head. Mm-hmm. But in reality, I didn't feel the best and yeah. the greatest because I wasn't allowed to do things on my own. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have a sense of self. You know, yeah. everything was done for me. It was a mixture of, so that in some way, I had super high self-esteem that I felt I deserved to be president, mm-hmm. plus also overcompensation because I was insecure that I wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. That was the same sort of origin story for me as in sort of like you kind of go, right, what's the hardest thing? What's the hardest thing that's gonna gonna prove to me that uh, of self, of who I am? You know that kind of okay. That's like stand up is is the, probably the, one of the hardest things mentally and emotionally to, to keep uh, driving through. Mm-hmm. And then if you become good at that, you get rewarded by laughter from the audience mm-hmm. and, and acceptance from them too. And then it, that feeds that that voice in your head that goes, well, of course, I'm good. This is the thing that I'm good at. You know, rather than mm-hmm. rather than like a, a just a transactional 
uh, employment that goes, okay, you're good at this, you get paid. That's not, it's not really, mm-hmm. it's not really enough, is it? Do you, is that the same, the same as what you're saying? Well, no, I mean, your, your thing sounds more evolved than me. I think, you know, the younger people are... Now. Good, yeah, <laughs> now. Yeah, to me, because I think every generation seems to, like, grow. And I've, I'm amazed at, like, how... I've read, actually, that the IQs of every generation are higher mm. than the previous IQs. Mm. You know? So what's sad is I'm feeling dumber and dumber. That's selfish sadness from my, me as well. I'm, yeah. I'm not proud of the new generation. Okay. I'm just jealous of the, the next one's coming okay. up. You know, okay. just needs to stop now. It needs right. to stop. That's enough children now. <laughs> I know. I know, exactly. But for me, it wasn't... Uh, I, didn't, I like the way you put it for you, the way, you know, this challenge, this great thing. No, what was it for me? I just liked stand-up comedy. I mean, I liked... I saw a movie about Lenny Bruce. You ever hear of Lenny Bruce? He was like a famous guy for like uh, saying what he felt. He was like one of the first comics that just started talking about hypocrisy in Mm -hmm. society and just saying... And there was a movie called Lenny starring Mm -hmm. Dustin Hoffman and Lenny Bruce. I don't think I thought I want to be a comedian, but uh, I was really interested in stand-up when I saw that. You know, Mm -hmm. I was like... Wow, and and then I remember I bought some Lenny Bruce albums. They like secondhand record stores had old Lenny Bruce albums, mm. and I started listening to them. And then in acting class, I would do some of the routines yeah. and get some laughs. And and then I gradually started thinking, well, maybe I could be a stand-up comic. And mm. and I always liked laughter. I mean, that was yeah. the you know being around friends, joking around. Mm. I think the only good thing about my relationship I had with my parents was any kind of laughter. Other than that, there was nothing. I mean, there was no honest love moments or any real communication I felt like not much at all the only good moment was laughter I didn't know it at the time thinking the only good moment was laughter but I think I naturally gravitated towards it because that was the fun thing for Mm. me you know so Mm. I'm looking back now back on it now I don't think it was the only there were some nicer moments I'm getting into this whole Buddhism power of now stuff and I realized how the mind can really make things negative, your thought process. And when I look back on things, I only see the negative. And, and sometimes if it takes me a little more being present and relaxing to really see that there are some positives. Yeah. But I think the mind always looks for the negative because it's always trying to protect you, the, yeah. the mind, to yes. survival. So if it sees the negative, it's, it's, it's helping protect against bad things. Yeah. Do you know, there's a, like my wife's into all this stuff, as I was saying before we started recording, oh, crystal. crystals and all this. And, and I think that, uh, and I told you that whenever I used to get on stage, when, when I met you like five, six years ago, I was rattling because of all the crystals I had right. in my pockets. And I wrote routines about that as well. But it really, I think that anything that helps you get through the day is very important. Like you've got a bit, need a bit of hope in your life and something right. to hold on to, right? Right. If you don't have God or whatever you, right. know, you're, um, you believe in, is that, that sort of like changing your uh, thought process to not being negative. Is is extremely important. But my wife said to me uh, thing the other day because I have this thing that I I write lists all the time. Like you, I was, you were talking about the lists here. You can mm, see I'm I'm all great. about that's doing great. my stuff, you know. And I'm like, and but the thing is, I used to put all of my self worth into the list that I would have to do in that day. And if I didn't finish it, then I would not feel very good. Mm-hmm. And that is not a good place to be because right. sometimes I put too many things on the list that I'm, like, right, I'm right. falling behind. I'm fa- like, right. we're, like we're saying about the, <laughs> the book that no, neither of us have read, the, um, the Alice in Wonderland, oh, right. the, the, the Mad Hatter, oh, I'm right. late, I'm late oh, right. I know, for a very important date. Right. So I was doing this, these lists and my wife said to me, she said, Winter, you've nearly done everything right really, on your list that you need to want, it, want to do, which is a great place to be, you know? And, and like, you know, is in like, you're up, you're up to date. You're, there's all the things coming on, but that's fine. They'll get done. Mm-hmm. And that voice in your head that comes on that says, you know, you're not doing enough. Just turn to, towards it and go, you're right. I'm shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And then go, you're right. I'm, I'm total shit. I am absolute. And then the voice goes, what? What? Mm-hmm. How, I'm shit. How, mm-hmm. how, you're agreeing with me. This, this, this is not how this is. We're supposed to fight against me. And right. for years I've been fighting against that voice. It'll give me a huge amount of energy. But then exhausting when I don't have that power within me to, to, to repel or confront it. Mm-hmm. So now that acceptance of going, yeah, you're right, I'm shit. And it's like, I'm like okay, great. And I can relax. I can go and do whatever I want to do, which has nothing to do with my lists. You know, I, that's, a, 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 I guess, a, um, <laughs> a, a retro sort of uh, fit for mind, mindfulness. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah, and I was like, that's a great idea. She's, and she did it, but she's all into that Buddhist stuff as well. But did that, did, I don't know, if, would that help, I don't know, does that help you, was that, you know, in any way? I like that. What do you mean by retrofit? Sort of like you're gymming it. 
Oh, I see. Yeah, so you're like, okay, click, that's it, done. All right, yeah. that's fine. So retro means past, like you're taking something from and change. What is retro? Isn't the past? Isn't that mean retro the past? I guess I, I, from my understanding of it, it's sort of like uh, you're recalibrating something oh, okay. to fit that moment. Oh, God, you know, I, like okay, well, just that. It's fine. There you go. Yeah, yeah, I can relate. That's a good technique to do it. That sounds maybe a little more like what is it? Cognitive behavioral psychology. CBT. Yeah, CBT, yeah. where mm-hmm. you're uh, the Buddhist thing, maybe is a little more. Not like arguing with one thought. That's great that your one thought stopped the other thought. But mm. you, the problem with that could be that you can get another thought answering that thought. Yeah. And you can keep going, which yeah. I may do. Like, you know, are you really okay? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you keep digging at it. Right. Keep picking the scamp, right? That's, right. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's true. Whereas the Buddhist thing might say, or Eckhart Tolle, I like that guy. You know him, the Power of Now guy. He wrote the book, The Power of Now. Right. Just being present and not thinking cognitively and you don't say to yourself i can't think because that's another thought mm. but if you're just present and just like take in like you know don't think that that's like a what is that, a dark blue ball yeah is that the earth or something that is a, a, a that is a crystal a, it's a crystal oh I see. that yeah. is a uh soda light that's what that is what is soda light mean? it is it's a type of crystal just as it's called soda light and it's apparently for i'm gonna I'm, my wife will I probably get this wrong. It's for clarity of thought, um, intelligence, uh, and I think, yeah, for that sort of just like kind of clear your mind and things like that. I see. And what is, is it made of crystal? What is crystal? It's a type of, yeah, it's a type of crystal. It's like a, what is, from is the it, earth. Crystal yeah, is a mind. type of rock or something? Yeah, that's right. It's mind, yeah. I see. Um, I've got fluorite there as well. Um, I've got, uh, that is rainbow quartz, and uh, it's a tiger's eye, right. and just a normal, just a clear quartz there. But yeah, as I say, I got lo- there's loads, got loads. And each different crystal has different effects on it? That's right, different properties. How do they know? They test it on people? I th- yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's what they do. So Tiger's Eye is apparently really good for energy um, and like uh, confidence and things like that. Incredible. But yeah, there's loads of stuff. Are there tons of like, how many different crystals do you think? Oh, there's so many. There's so many. I wonder where they find all these. Uh, a lot of them, they come, a lot of them come from like Brazil, Africa. Um, in China, there's a place called Crystal City. Mm-hmm. Which is like just they got massive blocks of like of, of things like of this, you know, just like covered with a sheet. And they just carve them into amazing animals or you know, like wolves, dragons. And unicorns. on the bottom, is there a little writing made in China? Uh, yeah, yeah. There, are, there is, yeah, yeah, there, uh, but yeah, it's it, yeah, all that stuff is amazing. It's amazing what they can do. And what kind of, I'm just curious, like, what kind of money is that? Do you have any idea? Like, oh, like what, how much these are worth? Yeah, uh, yeah, what? I think there's a, there's a price tag on this one. I think that is 23 pounds. Incredible, yeah. And what about that? Ball, the blue this ball, ball, I think this would be like, I think that'd be like 30 pounds. Is it? Yeah. Is it size have anything to do with it? Because uh, that's a little bigger it, and so it's it more does, expensive. It does, it does, but, and the clarity of like the lines that go through it, any, like the, in this one there's an eight as well you can see there. Yeah. And like, you know, just all these little specific characteristics of each crystal, because everyone is different. So you can get some absolutely beautiful ones, you know, and like, um, and some just ones that are just average and there's one, uh, one crystal called Ruta. Which is like it's got all these amazing like like tendrils that are like going through it. It's like it, oh, it's incredible. Like just the the, the shaft of, of of like a of like a shatter just going all the way through. It's amazing, but it just all holds together. It's how it grows. It's incredible. And it's supposed to. And it somehow, how does it influence our brains? I don't know. I think it's just energy. Everything has a resonance. Like we, we were talking before we started about how when you go back to a place right. that, that you resonate with. With, with that with the earth or something like that it's like okay well this is where I'm, I grew up and this is where I'm from this is the one thing that's influenced me everything here is is of me mm-hmm. uh, like, well, when I went back to Ireland I, I did a I did a gig I felt like my first gig in like six years because I hadn't gigged there I, I learnt my craft in the UK so when I went back there all my strength had left me I was like mm-hmm. oh every item of my every, every cell of my body is like oh this is I feel the fear again and so I think that stones these stones resonate with maybe different times of, of history. Perhaps this is just an idea. Different times of like history or different like ages. So maybe they absorb the the, the energy from those times. I I don't know. Um, just to just to throw mm-hmm. that one out there. <laughs> yeah. Or could it also be that one's mind makes that thought? Like I wonder. Like I remember when I did some cruise ship oh. gigs back in the late nineties. Oh. Israel. I went. I did a cruise ship gig in, on the ship, but we stopped in Israel. And I remember some we were traveling, we took a trip through the like the desert, you know, and I remember getting this overwhelming biblical feeling in me. Mm. But I'm thinking only because I know it's Israel. What if mm. no one told me this is Israel? Yeah. Would I have that biblical feeling? It's because mm. my mind is telling mm. me. So I wonder how much the mind plays. Like mm. 
you know, when you go back to Ireland, your mind is saying, oh, I'm back home. Is yeah. it really the feeling of Ireland or is it your mind going, this is Ireland? I don't know. You can't say definitively if that is because of the place or your memories because you're, you can't separate the two. You, right. have to, you would have to get somebody in isolation. I mean, they'd be messed mm. up and then take and go, what do you, how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Terrified. I've never been outside. You know? right. <laughs> and then, you know, and then right. just would go into absolute shock maybe and just die, you know? Right. But it's like, so, I mean, we, we're worth doing. I went to Barcelona recently. Mm. Different vibe altogether there. Everyone's happy. You know, there's a lot of, I feel it's a very positive place. But I don't know if that's just the weather or the place. You know, there's a there's a there's a lot of history there too. But it this it, it, I can't say. I think I, I think it's it's impossible for me to to di- dissect that one. Okay, I like um, asking those questions. Yeah, it's, it's a hard one. I like, it's good though. I mean, that made me think. It's good. You like you say stand up in coffee shops and like start doing your act as well. Yeah, that, that's improv in its best, right? Yeah, I did have a crazy sense of yeah that weird confidence i guess but also i was playing it safe in a way because i knew if i i would suddenly stand we had a, den, a restaurant chain called denny's mm-hmm. yeah. and uh like you know i would suddenly stand up uh, maybe 12 o'clock at night and in the middle of the restaurant and say i'm a comedian i'm going to try some jokes out. Mm-hmm. and i'd do some jokes and mm-hmm. usually i'd get good laughs because i had their total attention because they were scared right. you know i actually had more attention from them than a comedy club yeah because at a comedy club they're expecting you to come up that's true at denny's they're not you know so i actually did better at denny's mm-hmm. It was a funny story, actually. One time, a comedian couldn't believe I was doing this. He was a veteran comedian. I remember uh, Tim Jones, very funny guy, mm-hmm. and I think he's still doing stand-up. Mm-hmm. But he was working at the Laugh Stop in Newport Beach, where I had started. I was living in Newport Beach, uh, down south from L.A. And uh, I was a beginner comedian. Like, I occasionally MC the show, like host it. But he was uh, a paid act coming from Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And he said, I heard that you go up at these restaurants unannounced. Mm-hmm. You, you want to take me to one? I, want to, I can't believe I want to see this. So I... We went to Denny's and I did it. And it's a funny story. It's, while I'm doing my act, some people at one of the tables were talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And like, I was so like, you know, wired, like, you know, I'm a comedian, I got to do well. Mm-hmm. I started putting them down oh. for talking. And mm-hmm. looking back, on, he pointed out the absurdity. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're just patrons at a restaurant trying to eat. <laughs> they, they weren't trying to mess you mm-hmm. up. You, you're the person violating everything. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and I was, he's, I was such a nervous, I was kind of odd. I had guts, but I also was very nervous. I had a lot of anxiety while I was up there. So I was so anxious, I'd throw these like cliche, hacky, put down lines at them. Like mean lines. I can't remember what the lines were. Were you, did you have sex with your cousin or some stupid Mm -hmm. line? Mm -hmm. Attacking these poor innocent customers. Mm -hmm. It was like, Mm -hmm. I remember my friend Bob remembered this. We went to a movie uh, back then, and I got up before the movie started and doing stand up. I was getting some good laughs, and then the usher, comes up to me and says, you can't, the manager says, comes up to me, you can't do it. And I was doing so well, the crowd booed him and let me keep going. Oh, great. Yeah, so I had some good moments doing it, but I don't think, I think one time at a disco, they forced me to leave, I couldn't keep Mm -hmm. going. But in general, it was safe for me, because I knew if I bomb, it's like, hey, you're going unannounced, Mm -hmm. of course you're going to bomb. And if I do great, I'm a genius. So in a way, I was playing it safe doing that, you know. And and you're kind of making something happen, aren't you? They got something to talk about. Oh, we want to see where this goes. Is this guy, right. is this guy actually a comedian, or are is the, are they mental? Yeah, right, right, exactly. Yeah, their attention. But it didn't. I didn't do much. At first, I didn't have much material. Mm-hmm. But I probably only did five, ten minutes. You know, I would do that sometimes. We were saying before about that kind of. You know, you try something already that's hard to kind of prove yourself, and then in that situation, you're when you first start out, I had a real problem with like just going off the handle altogether, just losing my mind. You know, it's just like, oh, someone's trying to, me- you're trying to destroy me. Right. I will not be destroyed. I will destroy. I was like, oh right. no, that's, that's not how, that's a conversation. This is a conversation, isn't it? That hopefully you will find something funny in, right. uh, in interaction. Okay. You don't say many words, you just laugh, but you know, you're hopefully listening to my every word, but and it's not a, it's not a, in a way it's, it's a collaborative thing rather than a combative thing. Isn't right. It? And it took a long time for me to understand that too, but you're, you did acting. And yeah, but one that, point that I could yeah. make is that uh, I think also, honestly, I got into stand-up. I like your reason for doing it. Like, pick this hard thing and let me see mm. if I could do it. My thing was more narcissistic. I wanted, like, I remember looking at Lenny Bruce on stage, thinking all these people love him and are listening uh-huh. to every word. I wanted total attention and love. I mm. think 
for similarly to that I had from my mother, but it wasn't necessarily a healthy love from my mother. It was still love, which felt good, but she was like a slave. She gave in to me. She spoiled me, totally did everything. So I think I wanted to relive that, but maybe in a health, I don't know if I even wanted a healthy version of it. I just wanted mass love from, I wanted the whole world to be my mother. So I wasn't going into it because it's this hard thing and I want to see if I could conquer it. Mm-hmm. It was just strict, wild narcissism. Yeah coming from a weakened state like I was not a full person and I needed the world to try to make me a full person mm. I mean I think maybe my, my evolved thing is probably hiding a lot of that too to be fair I mean I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie I'm like yeah okay. uh, I'm, I'm relating more to yours now you're relating to mine I'm relating to yours I think we're swapping places I, don't, I didn't say I related to yours has this become your podcast now <laughs> but it's <laughs> great so I'm still on my own awesome <laughs> uh, yeah Okay, when you were starting out, did you have did you have the self awareness, or did you were like just like I, I need to? This doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm just I'm take I'm taken from these guys. Did you have the the awareness of self to go. Okay, this is no. No, it took me years to actually notice. I had no desire to give anyone else a good time. Uh-huh. It was all about me. The yeah. thought never occurred to me. Well, I'm giving these people pleasure. Yeah. Never. Yeah, I'm going to take it from them. Yeah. This is this is mine. You're not taking this from me. Well, not the, <laughs> not the fear that they're taking anything. I didn't even think they could take anything from yeah. me. I mean, I knew they could hurt me yeah. by not laughing. I knew mm-hmm. they could do that. But it was all about me. Because my whole childhood was all about me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me, 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 Alan, 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 Alan. You yeah. know, so... Yeah, the thought... And then years later, I heard some comedian say about something about, like, making the audience feel good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! I was like, "Whoa, great. that's happening!" Oh, yeah. I can come up to you after the gig and go, "Oh, it's such a it's such a noble profession." Uh, maybe for you, right? Right, <laughs> right yeah, that, that's right. Sometimes audience members would say, "Thank you so much. You made us feel good." I thought, "Really?" Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. That, that was for me. Yeah, that's nice. Right. What was the hardest thing you had to conquer then for you to go up on stage? Your, I mean, your first gig. You know, when when you went, okay, well, I, you know, I've got to. Did you just were like, no, I'm taking this. This is, that was it. No, I was scared. It definitely scared. But see, I was, I, I think being president of student government for a year helped me a little. Also the acting classes, you know, just a little, a little. So I was not quite as terrified of standing up in front of people as normal. Cause I was used to, I would try to throw little jokes in when I was president of student government, like little thoughts and, and then an acting class. But, uh, yeah, when I'd go up, it was scared cause I, I didn't know really how to do it. But doing the Lenny Bruce material, mm-hmm. that gave me a little confidence because I got the same laughs that he did, you mm-hmm. know. And when I listened to the album, so I did it in an acting class. So you learned the timing and the, the delivery yeah. and everything. And then when I had that acting role, it was Damn Yankees, I think. It was, no, Mr. Roberts. You ever hear of Mr. Roberts? No, it was another no. one. Yeah, that's right. They, the guy let me create my own monologue, my speech. And uh, I remember, I can't remember what I wrote or anything, but I was getting laughs from my own mm-hmm. monologue. So, right. But doing actual stand-up terrified me. I didn't... I didn't know how I would do that and I had no knowledge. I was just starting, you know, and it was a lot of try, you know, trial and error. And yeah. it, when I bombed horribly, it was very painful. And yeah. That, you, and that never stops for you, does it? It's just always a little bit painful, right? Yes, it still is. Yeah, it's, it's not it's, quite as bad because mm-hmm. you kind of know, like, your act is good and on the right circumstances, you'll do well. Yeah. But still, not doing well, it still hurts. But yeah. not like it did in the beginning. Because totally. in the beginning, you really don't know if you suck or not. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you do actually suck mm-hmm. and you don't know if you can get better. <laughs> and so when you really bomb, you're thinking, well, maybe I really can't do this. Yeah. So it really hurt in the beginning. But now it's still, it still hurts, but not like that. Yeah. You can still dig in, can't you? Go, well, you know, it's not my night, isn't it? That's what it is sometimes, right? Yeah, some, some comedian put it well. Uh, Mort Saul, you ever hear of him? Uh-huh. He's a, yeah, a very funny comedian. And uh, he put it well. He said it's like a date. And like you kind of said it earlier, it's like a conversation. So it's like a date, and you're on a date. You can't predict the date. You mm. can't, like, go out there. If you go on a date with a woman, you can't totally rehearse it and say when I say that she's going to probably say that and then I'm going to say this this way and then she's going to say that you can't do it you got to be present for the date now yes as a comedian you have your act but still your act like you said is a conversation and you have to judge the way they laugh and how they're laughing or how they're getting it will affect your timing and the way you say things and may even affect what you say you may change your act a little and move different places so you have to have the confidence to be present it took me a long time to be that way because in the beginning I'd be nervous and people wouldn't know it. Like audience mm. member friends would say, you didn't look nervous. Mm. If things were going well, I'd be fine. Mm. But even then I would have a tendency to rush because I'd want to get to the punchline mm. faster yeah. because the punchline is where the laugh is and the laugh would make me feel good. So I'd mm. want to get there too fast and I would rush too fast mm. to get to the punchline where 
It's all about setting them up and drawing them in. That's yeah. where the thing is, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so it took me a long time to learn that. But to learn that, I had to be comfortable with silence. You have to be comfortable with a certain amount of silence yeah, yeah. in order to get to the laugh. And it took me a really long time to be comfortable with the silence because I was nervous and scared. Totally. They're not approving yet. <laughs> yeah, they're, not yeah. they're not approving yet. Yeah. Oh, it's all on this punchline, right? Yeah, 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 yeah I would yeah. be nervous. But then you have to be have confidence that, through for me at least, the trial and error of yeah. figuring out timing. Some veteran comic, I can't remember his name, but a famous old-time comic said, the last thing a comedian learns is timing. Mm. And I think, in my case, it, it's kind of been true. Mm. You know, I've mm. gotten better at timing, I think. Uh, and like, you know Miles Davis? He's yeah. Sec, he's got... He, went, he said in an interview, someone said, he wrote that great jazz album, Kind of Blue, I think. Mm. It's like a famous album. And they said, how did you think of those notes? What, how to, he goes, it's not the notes, it's the pauses between the notes. Mm. And then, yeah. So it's the same thing in music. I find, yeah, it's the pauses a lot. Yeah. It's very it's just important. What, the silence is what you're saying. Yeah, it's the build, it's a build up. Yeah, that's right. It's and the, of course, you could build up too much. You could mm. pause too much, and that fucks it up too. So it's a very <laughs> delicate thing. Oh, and yeah. it depends also on the crowd that night. Yeah. So there's no like scientific formula. Mm. It's going to be different every night. So that's why it's an art and not a science. Yeah. And uh, what's it say? Um, so you're, uh, you're you you did your monologue, right? Do you remember your first joke that you wrote? You know, you first like do you remember your first joke? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, yeah, but not real, not 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 really. Uh, I think I did a few weeks ago. I remember thinking that probably was the first joke, but oh. I care. I was thinking like one thing. Not for my act. I didn't write this for my act. Maybe I should have. But one thing I would... I had a couple of jokes just in life. Like I would tell my friends in school. Mm -hmm. Like uh, One was... Uh, like when we... Do you call them proctors here? Like uh, they would... If they, you get a standardized test. Like in junior high school, we call it the SAT or the yeah. LSAT. Or yeah. the, they'd have a proctor, which means it's a professional person that comes in and supervises the test. They hand out the test, mm -hmm. they supervise, and they watch over the room. Mm -hmm. It's not your normal teacher. Yep, yep. It was, uh, I think it was right towards the end of the term. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was to determine what kind of class you'll be in next sure. year or something. Yeah, but yeah. I remember making a joke like, you don't know who that person's going to be, so I said, sure. Procter & Gamble. Oh, yeah. Do you, is that yeah, a yeah. Have you heard of yeah, that I've company? Heard, yeah. do, they do like all the uh, cleaning products and everything, right? Right, right. Loads of things. They do so, so many things. Yeah, so, so yeah. I think I was into like wordplay back then. Yeah. That was the only humor I understood. Like I didn't mm -hmm. know irony. I didn't yeah. even understand irony. Yeah, Procter & Gamble, another one in high school I would make a joke about in calculus class. Like I wrote a, I'd say I wrote a love song. It's called The Derivative of You. Mm. You know, because they're back, remember derivatives in yeah, calculus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So U is like a letter, mm. you know, like one of the like symbols. So The Derivative of You sounds like a love song. So that was my... And I remember that was like one of the jokes I would say, not in my act, but, and also I remember among family members, if we were in a restaurant, I would, before I go to the bathroom, uh, I'd say, I'm going to the bathroom, does anyone want anything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so that was like a, one of the first example of trying to be funny, but uh, yeah. When you're a group of people, did you have this thing then, you you knew that you were like, you, you wanted the funny one? Is that right? We we the one that always had to be the funny one, or did well, you? No, no, yeah, no? no. Or or did you? Like, okay, let's have this. Because um, I I think that like when for, for okay, this is for me now. When I first started stand up, I was like, okay, I saw my I, I had an archetype that I saw myself as like you know there's a, a, a very famous um, English comic, Sean Mio. I've heard of him. It's yeah. great. It's so good. Like just so um, such a curmudgeon, you know. He's like, whoa, he's great, yeah. and he's like, you make me sick. And like, he's mm. so good. Just it's just oh, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah. He says like that. He, you know, he sees himself as a gunslinger. So what would you see yourself as in that situation? A victim of gunshots. A vi <laughs> the, the deceased. A, bu a bullet absorber. Right. Okay. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Right. <laughs> the victim. Great. Great. No, I can I can see that. Uh, in some ways, yeah, a gunslinger, but I don't feel that confident, you know, it's okay. like, you know, I think my act, a lot of it's, some of it's based on vulnerability, mm. so when I'm talking about being vulnerable, I don't feel like a gunslinger, but I see his point, because you're really throwing out these, like, bombs, mm. you know, and hopefully they explode, yeah. you know, and so, uh, but I don't know, I, I do see that, but I don't really think of it in terms of that. So would you see yourself, like, as, as a yogi? No, I think, again, that's such a confident thing. Right. I think Yogi's very calm and confident. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not calm and confident right. there. I'm always thinking. I'm th and there is a confidence I have from years of doing this, I mm. guess. But 
I'm not that calm because I'm thinking up there what has to be done, as you know, in your head, right? I mean, that was one of the reasons I wanted to be a comedian. I remember at that first club I used to go to in Fort Lauderdale, I saw some comedian up there on stage, and I remember thinking, I really want to do this because everyone's looking at him, everyone's laughing, and he's got total attention, which is I got from my mother, total attention. I want total attention. Mm -hmm. And he's getting laughs. I, I want to be him. But I didn't realize in the comedian's brain, he's not thinking I have total attention mm -hmm. and I have total love. He's thinking how he's going to get this fucking laugh. And he's working in his head. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't like this thing where you just bask and say, look at everyone staring at me. Because if you do that, you're history because you're not, you got to move to the next job. Yeah. So uh, what was your question? I what kind of uh, archetype you see yourself as is like in your saying, well, you, you're not that, you're not the yogi, you're not the right. gunslinger, right. you're just, you're what, the, the, the Odo, what? Odo from Deep Space Nine. <laughs> I never saw, I've heard of that show, Yoda. but I never saw that. Basically, Odo was the guy that just was like, uh, he could be anything, uh, like he could like turn himself into anything because he was just like, he was like a, a, an amorphous mass that had a, a physical being that could be right. um, any sort of object shape. Um, inanimate kind of like that Woody Allen movie Zelig you ever hear oh that? no it was a great Woody Allen movie from the early 80s where he kind of became he gradually became a person he was around oh, he right. kind of like became that person yeah yeah no I don't become that either what am I I, I feel uh, what are the other character archetypes uh, I mean like you could say anything you could be anything like you know you could put yourself in like you know uh, I'm, I'm just a, like a, you could have some sort of tradesman or something just like I'm just a builder just build it right. I'm there I'm done that's it I've just got to work you know, or like you could be, um, I guess, a, a, a you got the gunslinger samurai, uh, or like you just, you know, that, that kind of thing. I think when it comes to a thinker, I think I'm just trying to think on stage. A philosopher? A philosopher, yeah, a little of that existential or yeah. philosophy, you know, a thinker, trying to analyze, trying to figure things out. I, yeah. And that's why I kind of, I think that's what it is, trying yeah. to, because I don't understand things. <laughs> so, so once a few times I've seen you, you sort of just pick it apart in front of them and go, "This is ridiculous, isn't it? Look at this yeah. thing," and they go, "Look, what, what, look what this sounds like. Look, mm -hmm. look what, the, look what you, we've been doing. You know, mm -hmm. this really does not. You're completely abstract thoughts showing them to your world. And I've seen people crying like you know when you do the there's a there's a there's a ing bit you do, which is uh, which I, I've seen oh, just it just goes down so well. You just keep on hitting the notes and there's a metronomic style to it." Which bit? It, is, it, is it singing? Oh, singing, 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 singing. Right, and it right. just and it's, it's so melodic and metronomic. It was like, oh, okay. it's hypnotic. There's lots of ethics in the in the, in the right. there, but yeah, it's great. And I've seen people do that. But it's like the and you're just pulling it apart, and they can just see it, the, all the things just coming together. So it's lovely your visual images of, of those words too. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, someone told me. Uh, I, yeah, I, I like I focus on words and uh, mm. try to play around. Someone told me I think. I can't remember who, it's a defense mechanism. They said, maybe you're so focused on words because I think you were such a scared kid, you focused on the words as a way to try to like deflect, mm. you know, you could be defensive if you could play with the word and throw mm. the word right back at a person or analyze. And, and I think if you throw it, focus constantly on the word, you don't, really have to, you don't have to really focus on the experience and be present. And I was a very scared kid, like mm. I, but in some way, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's my mind telling me I was scared. I definitely was scared, but there must have been another part of me that had some kind of uh, confidence. Because I can't think of the example now, but people have told me stories where I did things that were uh, confident. And mm -hmm. looking back, I'm surprised. Like, oh, yeah, I remember my friend. I had a friend named Stephen Blubstein, and everyone made fun of his name. Blub, mm -hmm. They call him Blubber. Mm -hmm. and, and he had like a... Uh, a haircut uh, looked like a bowl. bowl cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did mom do that? Or I guess. I guess oh, that's what happened. I made fun of him for that. And for some reason, everyone, he, he joined us in third grade, so he wasn't there from kindergarten, you know? And so for some reason, everyone was picking on him. And so I remember one time the teacher totally got sick of him or something and asked everyone in the class, what do you think? Should we put Steve in detention today? Or whatever the question was. And everyone raised their hand. I was the only one that didn't. And I remember she said to me later, that was very gutsy of you to be the only one that mm. didn't. So I must have had some confidence. Also, I remember another story, like in third grade, I remember, Mrs. Brownstein was the teacher, I remember, and she went out of the class for like a few minutes, mm. and someone put a thumbtack on her seat. So mm -hmm. she would sit, and when she came back in, I, I rushed up, and I told her about the thumbtack, and I took it away. Mm -hmm. Now you could look at it like I was kissing her ass, no pun intended, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, uh, I wasn't. I just didn't want her to be yeah, in pain. Of course. So in some ways, I could do nice things, but... Uh, or be gutsy, but in general, I was always this overthinker, mm. terrified of everyone, like overthinking, scared, frightened. And so you've come to the UK, and, and how long have you been here first? 
Well, this took two years. Oh, yeah. Uh, but again, coming here was terrifying. Yeah. I mean, that took, I mean, agonizing with, to me, make a decision is right. like, I uh, agonize back and forth, back and forth, hopefully, hoping in a way that the decision doesn't have to be made. By the time I decide, it will be too late because I just don't want to decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I know they say like not deciding is a decision. I'm better with that because right. it's less, less effort in a way. Mm -hmm. I finally came in uh, February of 2013 for just 10 days to check out the scene a little. I flew over and that scared me because mm -hmm. it was the first time I ever traveled to another country without an actual gig. Mm -hmm. Because the other time, I'd been to Manchester like 10 years before, but it was part of a gig, and like I felt like I was part of something. But coming to another country without, I was going to go up to a couple of clubs, and you know, on my own that I, but alone, you know, yeah. I was scared shitless. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and then to do Edinburgh drove me crazy with fear. I'd never uh. done that. And uh, so, yeah, fear is huge. And so, luckily, and my, a lot of times I've not taken advantage of opportunities out of fear. I haven't mm -hmm. done things. But this is an example of where I did it because I felt yeah. I had to because I wasn't getting enough work in America. What happened was it used to be the comedy clubs were the draw and then comedy clubs stopped being a draw. It was you had to be a celebrity to mm -hmm. draw your own audience. Mm -hmm. And I was friends with kind of some celebrities, but they were so huge. Mm -hmm. They had their own friends that they would open for them, right? And mm -hmm. so I wasn't going to open for them. And uh, I didn't friends with these other celebrities and so if you're not friends with a celebrity you can't open for them yeah and so it was very hard to get work in comedy clubs so you get caught in the middle right yeah yeah I mean you're good enough to close but you just you know like I, I can't open for you you know that's it right. it's like well you know and even if you open you're not going to make much money yeah but the other thing is uh, I was also a little too weird I could have I didn't evolve into like one of these headliners that totally killed with all crowds because my act became more personal to me I, mm. I couldn't be this comic that was trying like I said I wasn't into pleasing the audience really. <laughs> yeah. so I didn't try to create material that they would like right. I wanted to do stuff I liked that also got laughs because I wanted laughs I wasn't this like very reliable headliner mm. for the, the crowds that wanted simple things mm. which is a lot of the sh clubs around the country in the US they want traditional yeah. more traditional comedy and mm. so uh, I wasn't getting enough work I got mm. some but not enough to survive so I really came out here just because I heard it was good and I had to make a change because I just couldn't survive as a comedian. And like uh, you won the Amuse Moose competition, yeah, didn't you? right. I was Which a co-winner with Danny Ward, a very funny oh, guy. We yeah. split it. You know, he, I won the Judges Prize, which means the judges voted my show the best, and he won a thing called the People's Award, right. which I'm happy for him, but it made me depressed because it made me realize that people don't like me. No, but, but, the, <laughs> but the people that are important that like you, isn't it, right? The judges. Right. All right. Yeah? True. I but, mean, maybe it's back to your, you know, your lawyer days, isn't it? All right, that's right. <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> that's great. I mean, it must have really helped you. I mean, I, I think that, like, well, you know, you don't want everyone to like you, do you, really? You want some people to right. like you, so that they're going to be the, you know, the dedicated fans. Rather than just be chewing gum, right? Is like, right. oh yeah, everyone's seen chewing gum. That's fine. You want you want something special about you, something unique. And your act is incredibly unique, isn't it? It's, oh, it's not you. like you can't you can't say it's like anyone else's. Oh, so, um, w which is wonderful. I mean, look at like Paul Foot. I've heard saying. about him. Yeah. And you guys have so many great comedians out here. It's amazing the uh, the volume. That's it. I've heard about. I've never seen it, but I heard he's fantastic. Yeah, he's he's very uh, different and alternative, you know. Mm. And, and he's got a massive cult following, so mm -hmm. like it, it, it can really work here in such a small place. That you know, it's uh, you can really make some. It is true. It's amazing. I think you have way more cult following comedians out here than mm -hmm. in America. Like mm -hmm. people that the whole country hasn't necessarily heard of. But I'm sure they've heard of this Paul Foot because I've heard of. Him. But there are a lot of people that can draw huge crowds that I think the average of people from the UK may not have even heard of, but they still draw huge crowds. I don't think we have that much of that in the US. We have some of that. But. Do you think maybe it's like, it's just culture maybe? It's like, you know, everyone wants this, what everyone else has got as well, and you're not part of that, that homunculus mass that go, yeah. well, you know, that, the, you know, because if you're different, you won't survive, I guess, isn't it? You have to be aligned with something that's like they've seen before. They right. Get, they get, people, again, we're talking about change, aren't we? Change is scary. Right. Yeah. So they're all oh, okay. What's different? And, right. and and that is is what kind but of. But I don't see it? why is it? Do you think here people are more cool with accepting something different and following someone, whereas in America they're less able to do that? I'd say that here maybe is the it's such a small place. And there's so many different cultures here that they have to live together. Even they say people, you know, if you look at the Daily Mail, they say no one mixes. That's not true. You know, everyone does get on with each other and and, and kind of absorb gradually absorb everyone else's culture. But that's you know what I mean, though. Right. You know, it's like I think that that's what it is. I think so. So people are looking for something different, and also there's a there's a, a thing in this country as well that uh, I think it maybe it comes from the colonial uh, times that 
they go, oh, I love that. I was the first one there. Uh-huh. You know, I went to see, like I, I just spoke to a neighbour the other day and she went to see, the, he's a black comic and he was in the IT crowd. And he was, um, he was at the Hemel, Hempstead Town Hall and he did a show, this is like 15 years ago before the IT crowd. And this lady next 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 door, she said, "Oh, I saw him before. He was famous, and that's a like a like a badge that people like to wear here. Go, oh, well, you know, cool. I saw him. You know, that I think that maybe that's everywhere. Maybe people like that everywhere. Yeah, but what does that have to do? With, what is? What do you mean by colonial times? Is it like you know, sort of like they go somewhere and go, well, this is mine. That I I own. Uh, like, I own this 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 bit oh, of the history right. or a bit of like that's you know that, that's very much." Um, in this country, it's like it's like oh, it's mine, uh, you know. Whereas in America, there's more space to go. Oh well, you know, it's okay. Well, whatever. That's yours. That's fine. Whereas here, it's like oh god, I need I need something to call my own. Uh, and you know, because there's like, less space. Yeah, that's a big right. uh, reach, but it might be the case. Okay, that makes theory. sense. And I think another thing that I've noticed is you guys are more sophisticated. I think mentally, I like some people come up to me after the show and they really point out the way I did my act or something and. Like one guy used the, a word I didn't, wasn't even sure what it meant. You have recursive thinking. That's where you come back on itself. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I, but just a very smart analysis. I don't know. It just cause, it could be the grass is greener and that I'm here and I'm thinking you guys are smarter because of... But it just seems to me that in some ways you're more sophisticated and you appreciate something different because you're more sophisticated because maybe you read more out here or maybe mm-hmm. my friend pointed out when he visited, he said the enter, the... Education system is older here, so mm. it's a better education system. Mm-hmm. People are better educated. Yeah. In general, I, I find that there's like, uh, and some of the comments from people after the show are, are smart comments, really mm-hmm. smart. The, I think the thing is the weather, I think. See, the mm. weather's better in the U.S., so you could be outside more yeah. and you don't have to read as much. Yeah, yeah, true. But if you're indoors more, maybe you'll read more. Yeah. Also, you're in, my theory is you're in pubs more because of the weather, and in pubs you're talking to each other more, so you're developing your verbal skills yeah. and your bantering skills. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I think you people from Ireland are even wittier than the British because you have worse weather. Let's say we've got to escape drinking our way out of this situation, yeah. Like there's so many famous Irish like authors. And, right, like, George know, Bernard. No, he, was he from Ireland, George Bernard? I think, I think so, yeah. I think we've got a lot of good theories about the, uh, right. the way of it why the way things are and also yeah. because you have more stand-up maybe there's so much stand-up here i guess mm. also because the weather's bad and so people will go in the pub mm. and watch the comedian yeah like i went to barcelona to gig and like i'm like why are these people here this is right. a beautiful place right. you know they, and they want to hear nice things they don't mm. want to hear any darkness or sadness I'm like i want to hear some nice comedy what was the name of your show that you did in edinburgh the first one? Or the, oh, how many have you one? done now? Oh, maybe like, I think six. Oh, right. Six what was your favorite one? The first one, I don't really know if I have a favorite one. I guess the first one was probably the, the maybe the one, the best one in a way, because I spent years working on it, and mm. it was my best material. Uh, it was called Mentally Al. Then I did one in 2015, a couple of years later, that uh, I like, because it was pretty uh, daring, and it took more chances, mm. you know, and... Uh, and the one before that in 2014 was, had really good material, but it didn't have a good structure. Like it was, I didn't really have a cohesive structure to it. So that was a weakness to it. The last couple of ones I did, I liked parts of it, but I really was using it not to create like its own show, but just to get a chance to do an hour and play around and create more material. I stopped caring about creating a special show. Mm-hmm. Just with the joy, just for you again, like you know, enjoy it. And then you want right. to enjoy it. That's what you want to show you. Go, oh, God, I love this. This is fun doing. Well, also just to make routines better, mm-hmm. like because it's hard to like make routines. But when you're only getting ten minutes somewhere, mm-hmm. it's hard to work on a longer routine mm-hmm. because uh, sometimes that longer routine won't even you can't you can't open with it because they don't know you yet. Really, sometimes routines aren't designed to be open with. And then if you do a long routine within 10 minutes and it doesn't work well, your whole thing is ruined. So it's kind of, but if you have an hour, you can take a chance on 10 minutes in the middle of it somewhere, you know, so it's a freedom. So I, my favorite thing is getting to do an hour because you can take a chance and play around. And uh, so that's what I like. I didn't do Edinburgh this year. I, I didn't go up there, but I, it's, it's also just so hard to make sure you have an I do the free fringe. It's hard to make sure that you get an audience and there's a lot of pressure and uh, that, the business side of it just to survive. Mm-hmm. So I was glad not to do it. But, and also, it's a good thing to get to go up on new material nights and do 10, 15 minutes here in London mm-hmm. because it's, you don't have the pressure of getting an audience. Mm-hmm. And get, yeah, you don't have an hour, you can't do an hour, but it is still a good place to take chances. And you don't have to worry if the stuff bombs and you're going to ruin your whole hour show because a piece of it bombed. So you, you, you did six shows and you're, you're, like, right. you're just saying what shows you prefer the best. You didn't have a favorite. In some way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't there. really have a favorite. But the That's first it. and the third one, I think are the two that I right. like the best. Yeah, the one you like, oh, the bulletproof first one. 
and the last few were just like just play you bedding some stuff in and just playing around with it and seeing what where the where the, where the funny is in it right and just well the third one I did I have a closing routine yeah. uh, that I actually took from that I had in the second one but I expanded somehow uh, during the year here I expanded on it a lot like I added maybe ten minutes to it and I really liked that ten minutes that I added so uh, I I have and then. Uh, I did get nominated for an award that year too for with the Barry Awards. It's oh, like yeah. alternative comedy Great. Award for best uh, performing of a solo show, oh, nice. and that felt good. And then also that year was the f- first time I did the Free Fringe, and it was the first time I ever. Well, actually, I got some decent crowds that first year when I was nominated for that. I mean, when I won that, but I was getting some bigger audiences. As that was the cool thing. I never had happened to me before, where word of mouth would lead to audiences. Because mm-hmm. in the U.S., whenever I did a solo show. It was either, well, once a week, and I would never get people coming back. But with Edinburgh, you're doing it every night, and mm-hmm. you could actually have crowds grow. And the third year I did it, 2015, I was at, because it's the free fringe, it made it easier for crowds to come because it was free. I actually had crowds growing from the beginning of small crowds to actually growing. Mm-hmm. I'd never seen that before. And I was, like, proud of myself. Like, wow, I had no idea I could really do that. Could pull so maybe that was my favorite year. Great. Well, that's great. Of course, the following years, it didn't happen. So, <laughs> a bedding in period I guess you know just like just yeah. trying to get you know du- duking it out it's a slog isn't it it really is a slog at Edinburgh. it is very exhausting but mm. it's a great feeling it's like a gymnasium it mm. feels like you're working out totally. in a gym and yeah. uh, I really liked it do you have a plan you just like because you, know, you don't make, make decisions you said right I'm not, so gonna, I don't wanna, I'm not gonna think right. you to anything it's just, just seeing how it goes is that what you're doing well, you know, just, well, I should thing. probably, when the weakness is, I wrote, I've written a movie wow. uh, over a 20 year period. Wow. Cool. <laughs> Maybe I have a little Andy Kaufman in me because, you know, Andy Kaufman? Yes, yeah. His best friend wrote a book about Andy and we're, they said he was carrying around this novel that he had been writing for years and he never finished it. For me, I finished the movie and it's, I should, it's meant to be shot in LA and I should do it, but I have, I never had the energy to, I never had the money to do it and I could have tried to do it on my iPhone. You read about those people yeah, who are doing yeah. the iPhone, but I could barely get out of bed, much less film a movie on my iPhone. Mm-hmm. I could barely make a call on my iPhone. I just don't, mm-hmm. I'm very lazy and weak. And so, uh, you know, I would like, I'm, I have a gig, uh, a couple of gigs in November there. I'm going back for a week. I would like to try to see if I could get plans made to come back again to make mm-hmm. me make the movie. I just wanted to just do it because I'd written it. It's, you know, I've written, it's done and it's pretty good and mm-hmm. I should just do it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, whether I will, I, know, I don't know because... Uh, it's very easy for me to, uh, you know, just not do things. <laughs> it is. That's, 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 that's the same to you before. Now I've got that thing in my head that says, you know, uh, oh, you're not doing enough. And go, yeah, you're right. I'm not doing enough. Let's just relax. That's just the, the icing on the cake for me. I'm probably doing the same thing now. No, but well, you're somewhere evolved. Like I always, my fantasy was, one time I did want, uh, buy one of these boards and yeah. I did write the scenes for my movie. I like uh, that. I did do that. I did actually finish the movie. But what good is it? I've never made the movie. Yeah. But I never had... I can't even make up lists. Occasionally, I make like a little list, and oh. I never look at it. Never even look. Don't have Genius. energy to look. Best way to do it. No, <laughs> I, I but there's so much. But that's so great that you get. You're, you're almost finished your list, oh. and you're angry at yourself. It's such a better thing than never doing anything on your list, okay, which is so. what I do. You know, I just kind of occasionally. I'm getting a little more motivated to do a little more. I actually am surprised I am. Part of it might be that I've been doing that fasting thing, that oh, intermittent yeah. fasting. Right. I think that could try. It's up my even while I'm fasting, I feel kind of weak. But in yeah. other ways, I think it's making me a little stronger. The sixteen yeah. eight thing, where you don't yeah. eat for eight hours and you don't. Mm. I mean, you don't eat for sixteen hours and you can right. eat within eight hours. Yeah. I'm trying to wake up a little more because I realize, you know, the one good thing about death, and they say death motivates you because it's a final. Course. So uh, that's the one good thing. I've always been a guy who in school would study only when I knew the final exam was yeah. coming near. Yeah. So luckily death is like the final exam and I'm mm. starting to wake up a little more to do a little more. But if, believe me, <laughs> I didn't have death coming, I wouldn't do shit. <laughs> that's lovely. It's lovely. <laughs> ah, the exam's getting closer and closer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was but I would, lo- I would love to be able to do something. It just, I can't imagine. I, I feel, you know, it's just hard. I have to look, you know, first of all, it costs money to buy one of these things. How am I going to put it up? I got to find a nail. I got to have a hammer. You yeah. know, every thought yeah. is like, no, no, no. When I first put this up, I put up half of it. I put a list up there and said, finish putting up whiteboard. Right, that's right. <laughs> right, that's great. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That would be a bit of fun. Uh, I think, well, uh, well, Al, thank you for coming on the Comedy Defect, man. It's thank been you. an absolute pleasure. And thank we you. can find you where? Uh, Al LaBelle. Uh, uh, 
Well, a live, you can find me walking the streets. Cool. That's the right. that's the real in London. Name. How long are you going to be in London for? What do you think? Playing well, I have no. I'm just going back for that week to the U.S. Right. in November, but I'm coming back. You know, I'm playing a player to stay in here. You know, I I, I might be here until I die. Oh, great! <laughs> Fun exam, great. Right, right. Well, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm on the Facebook at Al at Alubel at Twitter if they want to. Yeah. You know, A L L U B E L yeah. and uh, yeah, great. If I want to follow down the street in London, London somewhere. Brilliant. Yeah, I walk around and think and walk. Cool. Yeah. Great man. Well, thank you very much for your time, man. It's been great. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, for it, man. I'm glad to realize that I actually have done something. <laughs> being on here. Yeah, it's a decision. So now this made a decision, and now I now I'm going to do the show afterwards. That's yeah. two things. Yeah. I'll take the train back. I can do stuff like that. I take trains, go to yeah. the gig. I could do that. Yeah. And I could do the gigs. It's just the downtime between. Mm. I can get lost. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, I go to the gym. I do stretches. Mm -hmm. I do do that, and I do write jokes and. Yeah. But I need to get, I, my next thing is I would like to make lists and actually start really doing all the things, mm -hmm. you know, because it's too easy to just have coffee and just mm -hmm. like read maybe a newspaper a little yeah. and then not do yeah. it. Yeah. That extra energy to procrastinate is great, isn't it? Right. Oh, more coffee. Boom. That's right. Like, oh, I've got all these things to do. Right. Then you just get, get gridlocked with stuff, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Some great one. <laughs> thank, thank you. And that was episode 79 with the completely original, totally unique, alternative comic, Al Lubel. He's on the internet at allubel.com. He's on Twitter, Al Lubel. He's also on Facebook, Al Lubel. <laughs> I'm laughing because I've seen his act, but you've got to go and see him live. He is absolutely not to be missed. Now, that is this episode. That is that is it. I enjoyed it. I'm glad he was so patient with me at the beginning. We settled and we did it and we nailed it at the end. I think we had a lot of fun. So you can follow this podcast on, we're on Facebook, uh, The Comedy Defect. We have a page, you can join the group. And you can follow me, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, at Winter Dominus. And you can also find me on Twitter, if you want to go and follow me there. I've got many followers, because I told you, I deleted my account and restarted again. I'm there on Twitter, at Joker Season, if you want to follow me. I was just blessed to have the time with Al, it was just such a pleasure and uh, yeah I just had such a great time I hope you enjoyed it now if you want to support the podcast you can I know it's really hard everyone's asking for donations for loads of different things no one has the money or time we're I know everything the, the lethargy is setting in there's a bit of sort of uh, a sort of small bit of depression happening here because of the lockdown and just so frustrated you can't do anything I understand that so if you can't I know that money's tight people are losing their jobs and everything that's fine if you want to give the podcast a like you can do that you can join the group, you can do that. You can go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defect Podcast. You can donate as much, as little as you want. You don't have to, but if you can't do any of those things, just tell your friends, share your favourite episode, you know, or maybe write a review. Say, good, <laughs> liked it, didn't like it. Or don't do any of those things. Understand. There's a lot of things vying for your attention out there. And you know what, right? It's just a podcast. It's okay. There's other things, more important things to be doing. Like, you know, enjoying your friends, your family, you know, enjoying the now. That's all you got to do. So what I'll say is this, right? That was episode 79 with Al Lubel. Next episode is with a bit of a <laughs> instigator. He's a, He's got a head in him. He's got an interesting marketing brain, this guy. It is with a very funny guy. Uh, just a, a devious guy. He's brilliant. It's with Nathan Cassidy. And he also has a podcast called The Cypod. That's what it is. He's on, he's on Instagram, all those places. Cypod, that's what it is. So he sort of, he interviews comedians, but he also sort of delves into their psychology as well, which is a very interesting too. That is Nathan Cassidy for episode 80. Until then, it'll be at the end of November. Take care. Be good to yourself. I try to be good to other people too. And don't get too stressed. You know, go to bed early. Take it easy. <laughs>